It's a funny place to be, stuck in a seemingly mundane world with an inner knowing that the universe is so much more than our mortal minds can comprehend. Yet we all have the capacity to know peace and our oneness with the wholeness of life. And through these interviews, discussions, and reflections, it is my intention to share this possibility. I'm Ryan Kurzak, and this is the Kriya Yoga Podcast. In this episode of the Kriya Yoga Podcast, we're going to be listening to an interview I was able to do with Roy Eugene Davis. Mr. Davis was a student of Paramahansa Yogananda, and he was my sole source of information and instruction on the Kriya Yoga path. Over the years that I knew him, I would go to his chalet on um, the grounds at Center for Spiritual Awareness, and he would discuss projects that were going on there or books he was working on, or he would check in to see how the work was going in Asheville, leading meditation groups, uh, or when I used to live in West Virginia, uh, teaching classes there. But on two occasions, uh, he allowed me to bring my microphone and my camera to ask him some specific questions related to the Kriya Yoga path. And this is uh, another one of those interviews. Now, these interviews were originally recorded for the Kriya Yoga online channel, Kriya Yoga online channel on YouTube. So if you want to watch the interview, you can go to youtube.com slash Kriya Yoga online and go to the search function and type in Roy Eugene Davis and the interview should pop up for you to watch. But I hope you do enjoy this discussion. Uh, as always, Mr. Davis touches upon some uh, very deep insights on how to walk the Kriya Yoga path, how to meditate well, and how to make the most of your own life. So I hope you enjoy it. I'm here again with Roy Jean Davis, a direct disciple of Paramahansa Yogananda, and also the spiritual director of Center for Spiritual Awareness, a Kriya Yoga meditation retreat center in Lake Mont, Georgia. Thanks for being here with me, Mr. Davis. Hey. Enjoy being with you always. So I have some questions for you. All right. Um, number one, uh, many people ask me, what is the best way to learn Kriya Yoga? So from your perspective. The best way to learn Kriya Yoga, of course, is to have good source material. And it helps to have someone who is reliable, trustworthy, who has experience in the practice of Kriya Yoga uh, to relate to. Uh, first of all, uh, maybe I should define, we should define what Kriya Yoga is. Uh, the word Kriya is a Sanskrit word that simply means process or action or procedure. And uh, Yoga, uh, in, the, in its pure definition, means the holding together of attention and awareness with one's pure essence of being or true self which is why we call that awareness self-realization or experience and knowledge of our true nature. So Kriya Yoga is not a separate yoga system. You know, there are various yoga systems, Hatha Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Raja Yoga. But the Kriya Yoga tradition, which I represent as a disciple of Paramahansa Yogananda, but it uses the best uh, procedures or methods of various systems of yoga. And it's a matter of emphasis. Our emphasis is to have uh, this aspiration to experience or realize the ultimate aim of practice, which is spiritual enlightenment. And today, of course, as you know, uh, Millions of people are practicing various forms of yoga, mostly hatha yoga and uh, yoga practice for health and psychological improvement. This is of this has value. But uh, in, in the process, I think many times uh, it is uh, spoiled and commercialized and uh, not uh, completely explained in its, uh, uh, as far as the full value of what yoga can practice can offer. Uh, of course, Hatha Yoga and the other systems of yoga have their place, but I was always inspired from the very beginning 
to want to be spiritually enlightened. And when I was with my guru, Paramahansa he encouraged me to that end. His emphasis was always, you can be spiritually awake and pay, pay attention to the essentials and get it accomplished in this lifetime. So that was his major emphasis. Now, I, I realize that the majority of people who are attracted to the practice of yoga uh, don't have that uh, strong resolve or high aspiration to be spiritually enlightened. They're not even aware, conscious or knowledgeable about what a spiritual enlightenment is. And many people, uh, of course, like in the Bhagavad Gita, they start their practice of yoga because they just want some degree of physical improvement or psychological improvement, improvement in their life. They want to uh, avoid or overcome some painful circumstances or some want psychic power or ability. But uh, I think of the emphasis is to aspire to be self-knowing and self-realized and one will be patient uh, and they learn how to, how to proceed and stay with the right practices that over a period of time, years in my experience, uh, they will have satisfying results. And so how does one know that what they're learning is authentic? How do you know the Kriya Yoga that they're learning is an authentic practice? Well, the, one, uh, one t- test is to try it out. Uh, when we are uh, aware of procedures that seem uh, realistic and useful, to test them. I remember Paramahansa Yogananda telling, telling that in the early years, in 1920s and 30s, when he traveled widely and lectured to big audiences in major cities of the country, now and then a person would come to him and say, Swami, uh, I enjoy being with you and I enjoy attending your classes, but how do I know what you say is of value to me? And his answer was usually, well, you try it for six months and then come back and tell me. So it's, uh, you, have to, you have to try it. You have to do it. And I recall another story about Yogananda. Someone was talking with him and asking questions. How do I know uh, what God is? How do I know that it's possible to be self-realized? How do I know it's possible to uh, be aware of these higher realities? And uh, so and so says this, and this book says that. And Master said, uh, "You're like a person who's talk- always talking about apples and the various species of apples, and, the t- and what others say about apples, but you haven't eaten an apple. <laughs> and you're like that with God. Why don't you get? Why don't you get busy and take a bite? <laughs> so <laughs> that's the key to get involved in the practice. So I was very fortunate." Uh, when I was eight, 17 and 18, I was first introduced to yoga philosophy by reading books. And I was attracted to the idea that if you do certain things, you'll have certain results. And uh, you didn't have to be a blind believer, but you could experiment. And then when I met Paramahansa Yogananda, I had his example. He was a good role model and his encouragement and his instruction. But he reminded me that I had to do a lot of the work for myself, that I had to be the one to examine my, my uh, tendencies and, and uh, drives and tendencies and learn to live right and do right and to meditate and have the experience of meditating. So that's what I did. So when I was with him, I was with him for a little over two years before he passed in the early 1950s. And then after that, I was two more years uh, in the monastic uh, uh, environment. Uh, I was the minister of the Self-Realization Fellowship Center in Phoenix, Arizona at that time, right after he passed from 1953 to 54, 52 to 53. And uh, I was there all by myself over in Phoenix. I went to California to attend uh, func- functions at SRF headquarters, like summer summer convocations and Christmas meditation and so on. But the rest of the time I was there, uh, conducting Sunday services and doing a little a little counseling, not much, but most of the time living very much as a Trappist monk, although I was a yogi monk. But uh, up in the morning at four o'clock, meditating for four hours, 
uh, doing uh, attending to my work duties on the property during the day. Again, meditating in the evening for two or three hours in the early evening. And uh, that was my routine for two years. So I learned by doing. And uh, the experience was very beneficial. So individuals who are not necessarily in a monastic environment, after they've been practicing for a year or so, how do you recommend that they live their life or approach the practice for the first few years to really get into it and make it stable? Uh, not everyone can live or is even, even is attracted to or adapted to the monastic life. Uh, but uh, everyone can decide to be self-disciplined or disciplined to the extent of establishing their priorities. And so if, they're, if they work and have a uh, have a family or married, have a family, uh, whatever they're doing in secular life, they can still set aside uh, time every day for uh, inner examination and meditation practice and for a little bit of uh, inspirational or informative reading, not too much. I don't recommend uh, reading too widely, diverse opinions and getting all confused, but reading good basic basic information for inspiration and and to acquire necessary knowledge and then put into practice what we what we learn i think that's the important thing uh, uh, all enlightenment traditions and most religious uh, traditions teach uh, the importance of ethical living and responsible living and growing to emotional maturity and uh, cultivating a, a uh, or at least having the aspiration to, to cultivate and have a relationship with a larger reality people call God. Of course, you, you perhaps know that, uh, I'm sure you do, that the word God, not God, but the word God is only a, maybe 1,400, 1,500 years old since it was innovated because it comes from Dutch and old German languages. Uh, the word God is not used, of course, in the Old Testament or the New Testament, which is written in Greek, and uh, not, certainly not in the Eastern Scriptures. But uh, the first the first appearance of the word God, when it evolved from Old German, was about in, in the year about 400, when the first Christian Bible was translated into Old German uh, for the Gothic people. So... Uh, Whatever word we use for that ultimate reality is all right. And however we think about it in the beginning, many people, of course, are not able to uh, conceptualize, imagine, or relate to an impersonal, transcendent reality. And so they, uh, they think in terms of God as a person or having a, per uh, a personal interest in them or having wishes and desires and uh, will for them and the world, world order. But so sooner or later we outgrow those uh, ideas, or should I outgrow them in due time, and begin to co contemplate that ultimate reality as it is, which has an absolute or pure essence, which is transcendent, incomprehensible, but realizable, in comprehensible to the mind, because the mind has limits. But, uh, and also there is a, an expressive aspect of it with uh, energetic characteristics, a Sanskrit word is guna, which uh, make possible a manifestation of universes. And so uh, this in the last several years has been my uh, idea and uh, awareness and increasing realization of what that ultimate reality is. So my experience is it becomes more clear and more real uh, in the course of time. Uh, I've never had any dramatic enlightenment revelations that uh, over sudden, you know, sudden dramatic conversion experiences. My experience over the years has been uh, progressive un in clarity of awareness, more understanding, uh, expansion of consciousness, more insight that has just sort of happened over the years. And thankfully it's continuing. 
So for individuals who are steady on the path, um, I remember you telling the story one time about how you asked Yogananda uh, if many of the sages and saints in the autobiography of Yogi were fully o- awake or enlightened. And he said, not many, or you can tell right. the story, not many. Yes, I used to visit him uh, when I met him in 1949 at Christmas time, the Christmas season. I was only at the SRF headquarters uh, th- three or four or five weeks. And then he sent me over to Phoenix, Arizona to help with the center there. But he said, come back to see me every two months. So I, for the next two years, every two months, I took the bus from Phoenix to California, wherever he was, and uh, spent a few days with wherever he was. and had private time with him. And uh, in the summer of 1950, he, he was living for the most part at his retreat house out in 29 Palms, California, where he had chosen to live in order to have seclusion and for freedom to write uh, commentaries on, on Bhagavad Gita and other scriptures. And I used to visit him there. And I never went to, went to him with a lot of pressing questions. Uh, I had access to philosophical information in books. I'd heard him speak uh, publicly and privately to disciples, so I knew uh, what he taught, but uh, I went for his, for his uh, well, Sanskrit word darshan, which means perception of divinity, just to be with him. Because when I was with him, just in his presence, I was uplifted, my consciousness was expanded, and he always said worthwhile things, of course, but the main thing was the the attunement with his consciousness and what he, what he was at the deepest level. But one time I was over there visiting him and we were walking around the perimeter of the retreat site and uh, he was quiet. He tw- he tw- we chatted for a while. He, I let him do most of the talking. I found that was most useful. And then he was quiet for a while and then he asked, do you have any questions? Well, one popped into my head. Uh, A few weeks before, I had been perusing his book, Autobiography of a Yogi, and as you know, in in the book he told about how when he was a young boy, young man, in the early 1900s in India, that he would uh, search out people who were supposed to be saintly, and some probably were, and examine them and sit with them and talk with them, and uh, the thought had come to my mind, I wonder how many of these saintly people by now are fully enlightened and liberated. And so I asked him that question. And that's when he, without hesitation, he, he said rather nonchalantly, he said, oh, not many. He said, many saint, saints are satisfied to experience the bliss of God communion, and they don't aspire to go beyond that stage. Then he paused and said, but you must go all the way, meaning you must wake up completely. And uh, he wasn't finding fault with people who like to meditate to a stage of bliss or or, or spiritual enjoyment or uh, peace of mind or whatever pleases them. But he was just saying, that's not the end. That's only, that's only partial, partial awakening. And... Uh, <clears throat> But then, of course, uh, of course, I realized there were not many of his disciples that I know, knew at least, who had gotten to that stage of, of enlightenment, or, or not many who were even proficient in meditation practice. Not that they weren't good people, they were good people, good-hearted people, kind, uh, compassionate, caring, uh, devoted to their practices, but uh, not all of them uh, were, were successful in being fully awake before they passed. But uh, I don't have any judgment about that, but I observe, and uh, mainly because I always was observing myself, how am I doing? Not in comparison to them, but how am I doing? And uh, so I resolved when I, when I began to read books on world religions when I was in high school, I got books from the county library, and uh, I'm still surprised when I think about it that little war in Ohio, a country town, uh, mostly people, factory workers and small farmers, 
and uh, had books on yoga philosophy and world religions that I could borrow. But uh, when I read about Buddha and other saintly people who were said to be spiritually enlightened, my response was, yes, I, I can be like that. I want to be like that. And uh, when I was a teenager, I went to a fundamentalist church with my parents, because that's what you do in farm community. And uh, but I never bought into the doctrine that was being taught from the pulpit or in Sunday school. It was just uh, too, uh, to me, it was not realistic. And it was only when I became exposed to so-called Eastern thought uh, or Enlightenment traditions, which have their origins uh, in the East, uh, that doors opened in my mind about the possibilities of self-actualization, that is, uh, bringing forth, eliciting my innate spiritual qualities. And uh, I always thought, well, if others have done it, I can do it, and I want to do it, and I will do it. So I've always had that aspiration. And... Uh, confidence that it's possible. And then, of course, after I spent four years in a monastic setting, uh, I felt that I had sufficient uh, time in that uh, vocation, and I withdrew from it and was in the army two years and in the medical service. It was after Korean War, so I didn't have to serve in, the, in a battle zone. And then after that, in 1956, I began to travel and lecture and write and teach and learn by experience how to do it. And uh, so I've been doing it now for the past almost 60 years. And uh, I'm just as enthusiastic, just as interested in doing it now as I was when I started out. Uh, I realize from observation and experience that only a few out of the many people that I touch and have the opportunity of working with will actually get the message and be able to follow through and have profound, in-depth results, but some will. And uh, it's like Yogananda, when he used to lecture to these big crowds in the 20s and 30s, sometimes 2,000, 3,000 at a time, in big auditoriums for eight or 10 days, and then follow up with classes, would have 1,000 or 2,000 people at his classes, where he would teach them more, uh, uh, intensively and initiate them into meditation practices. And someone asked him one time, uh, how many of those people have stayed with their practices? And he said, not many. But he said, I knew that then, that only a few would stay with it. But I was sowing seeds in the soil of their subconscious minds, hoping that uh, some of them would sprout and do them some good in the future. So we can only hope for the best for people, wish them well, and work as a karma yoga, really. We do our duty, and it's not a matter of ego drive, ego motivation, and our feelings aren't hurt if we don't get the response we would like to have. And we don't feel proud if we do see positive results. We just do our duty. It's what we do, and not attached to what we do or to the results of what we do. So I always felt when I was a teenager that I was called to the ministry, well, that's a term we use in Christian, Christian circles frequently, ha having a calling. But I felt when I was a teenager that I was called to minister, to teach. And I had no idea at that time what I would teach because I knew it wouldn't be the fundamentalist Christian doctrine. And it was only later when I, when I learned about yoga and then met Yogananda that I had the opportunity to have more of an awakening and more of an understanding. And uh, since then, things have just unfolded. Most of the positive, worthwhile things that have happened in my life, although I have used my executive abilities and the knowledge that I've been able to acquire to function effectively, but most of the worthwhile things that have happened have just happened spontaneously. Like It's, it's like grace. It's an, uh, sometimes unexpected, unasked for, certainly unearned and un, uh, occurrences that are a benefit to me and to others, things that just happen, which sort of, to me, is an indication that I'm on the right track, that life doesn't have to be a matter of constant endeavor, constant effort, 
and hardship and difficulty and pain and suffering, that uh, life can be enjoyable and uh, satisfying and actions can be effective. Uh, so it's just a matter of finding our right place uh, and uh, playing that role. And in the course, in the Sanskrit term for that is dharmic living. Dharma has many, many shadings of meaning depending upon the context in which it is used. But generally it means rightness, righteousness or rightness, the right order of things, uh, implies that which upholds, maintains. So whatever uh, we do, whatever in our life upholds and maintains us and the world order, we can say is dharmic. It's uh, right, righteous. And uh, if we're in our right place in the, in the universe, doing what we are called or destined or best qualified to do, then that is said to be dharmic living. Uh, we're living properly. And, you know, for instance, the word Hinduism is a, a word that it was coined or originated by foreign invaders many hundreds of years ago. Uh, knowledgeable Indian people uh, refer to what they teach and believe in their culture and spiritual practices as Sanatana Dharma, the eternal way of rightness, or the eternal right way often mis mistranslated simplistically as eternal religion, but it's not religion, the word religion is not even there, it's not in the vocabulary of, of Indians anyway. But uh, so it's not the eternal religion, it's the eternal way, eternal right way of living, right thinking, right behavior, right contemplation, right aspiration, very much like the Buddhist, uh, uh, Buddhist, uh, uh, precepts for for living in the right way and uh, <clears throat> right motivation right right thinking right right living right practice right contemplation and the result is uh, productive living so hopefully enlightened uh, self-realized uh, living or at least the capacity to be spiritually enlightened. And uh, I remember when I was uh, at that stage, when I was 18, I'd read Yogananda's book, Autobiography of a Yogi. Someone else at that time happened to give me a copy of Life magazine. I published that year, I think in May of that year. And there was a several page article, illustrated article, photo illustrated article, uh, right, uh, telling the story of Ramana Maharshi uh, in South India in Arunachala. And I remember there was a full page photo of him with his looking straight out with his luminous eyes. And I thought, wow, I, 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 I experienced a darshan or an uplift or a blessing just looking at the picture because he was so, so obviously so serene, so peaceful. And satisfied with himself at a deeper level than just the picture was up, was uplifting. And of course, people used to visit him or, or to just be with him and sit with him. And he didn't always, he didn't always talk very much. And so he didn't, didn't give public lectures. But uh, now and then people would ask him, how can I be self-realized? And he would answer, it's really very easy. All you have to do is be still. But he was talking about that complete stillness of uh, mind and and emotions, the complete settling. Like in the second sutra, Patanjali's Yoga Sutra treatise, where he, he explains the, the end result of yoga practice, and that is the quieting of the changes and movements in the mind and awareness which allow the true nature to be self-evident or self-revealed, self-shining. And uh, otherwise, he goes on in the uh, following sutra, or verse, or aphorism, to say, otherwise, attention and awareness is again, again inclined 
to identify with the influences that modify mind and awareness. So that's human nature. And uh, people meditate, you know, try to meditate, and common common, uh, uh, testimony or complaint sometimes is, I can't control the mind. I can't settle my emotions. And so there is that understanding there that contents of the mind have to be quieted, emotions have to be settled, even the impulses that arise from the unconscious or subliminal levels from below the threshold of the conscious awareness, the impulses that arise that activate thoughts and emotions have to be pacified. And when that occurs, all that is left is awareness of being if we don't go to sleep. <laughs> the key is to stay awake. Don't go to sleep. But just just be there in the moment. And all that remains then, I am the witness. I am the observer. I am the knower. I exist. That's it. And, and there's nothing, nothing beyond that to, to actually experience or to realize. But uh, it sounds simple in talking about it. But obviously, isn't that simple to experience? Because otherwise, there'd be more enlightened people. And uh, but it more, more and more are awakening, and, and of course, in our era, our current time cycle period in, period of time, there are more people who are becoming at least interested in spirituality, and more people becoming uh, intellectually competent. And of course, we still have a, a large percentage of people who are still inward, too, too inward directed, too egocentric, and and uh, too self-serving, and uh, confused, and so on. But, a lot of, but more and more people, we look out on the world scene, we see a lot of more, a lot more people who are becoming uh, uh, responsible for taking care of the planet, taking care of each other. Uh, sharing their their higher understanding. More and more people are practicing meditation today in all walks of life. Even many people who are, don't don't think of enlightenment or the end result of their practice, but they meditate because they say, "I function better. I think more clearly. I'm happier. I'm healthier when I meditate on a regular schedule." So this is all to the good. And I remember Paramahansa Yogananda telling me and a few other disciples in 1951 who were talking with him, and he told us about his vision for the future of yoga in the West and in the world. And he said, in the future, yoga will be taught in schools. You will see it. Well, it's happening now. And uh, so... uh, more and more people are opening, being open to these ideas and to the possibilities of self-discovery, and that I think this is good. So, over the many years that you've been practicing and teaching Kriya Yoga, is there any in particular lesson or understanding that you've learned that seems most important to you from the whole practice? Main thing I think is uh, once we are knowledgeable and we know how to proceed is that we proceed in the right way with good right intentions and uh, we, we are persistent in it, but patiently so. I remember one occasion I was visiting Paramahansa Yogananda and at his desert retreat and he uh, was just talking quietly and he said, uh, uh, Sometimes we want to, he was talking very simply, we want to know God, we want to be self-realized very quickly, and this is good, but we have to be patient just in case it doesn't happen the, the day that you want it to happen. <laughs> and what he used to say, you want it with all your heart, you want to know God with all your heart, and expect to know it, uh, know it every day, but if it doesn't happen, don't give up. And so there's that balance of aspiration and yet patience, because we, uh, some people can have an instantaneous, dramatic, 
transformational convert, conversion experience uh, and a wet spiritual awakening that is authentic and enduring or the results of which are enduring but most people awaken little by little and then even the people who say yeah I don't see much evidence of progress if they are living right and attended to their practices uh, and every now and then look back uh, not to live in the past, but just to look back and compare how they are now to how they used to be, they will see that they have improved. And also, if they read the, the, the literature, the Bhagavad Gita, Yoga Sutra, any their favorite literature, whatever it might be, regarding spiritual matters, and if they, if they notice that they are understanding it now more, more clearly, and they are seeing, seeing something there they didn't see before, that's evidence of improvement. I know a woman, a woman went to Yogananda one time and she complained that she, she didn't have any dramatic meditation perceptions. No lights, no thrills up, up, up the spine, no ecstasy, no revelations, no contact with spiritual beings. And Master said, well, do you have more peace of mind? Well, yes. Are you inwardly, more content inwardly? Yes. Uh, and so on, I went on and asked her a few more questions. He said, well, you're progressing then. And uh, so, so don't uh, equate dramatic meditative, meditative perceptions with uh, spirituality or spiritual, spiritual awakening. Because many of the meditative perceptions that fascinate some people, they are mind-produced phenomena or uh, the result of mental agitation or emotional unrest, and, and not, not of any great value. So, uh, if we have pleasant meditative meditation experiences, that's all right. But uh, if we sit there and say, I've got to feel bliss, or deeper experience of bliss, or joyousness, or I've got to have a... I have to see the spiritual eye, <laughs> or I have to have a get out of my body, or I have to have astral vision and clairvoyance. These are time wasting, uh, time wasting desires, and we we don't need that. Uh, sometimes we can have unusual perceptions, but uh, even then they should be looked at with objectivity. And uh, also, no matter how profound our, our perceptions seem to be, it can be useful to inquire, well, is there anything beyond this? Is this the end, or is there something beyond this? So that we don't get stuck at any level and think that we've got it. Now I've got it all. I have arrived. Now I'm, going, I'm the Messiah now. I'm going to go out and change the world and share my revelations. That's a big trap right there. <laughs> so, you know, just, just patiently persist in the right way with faith, that is, with conviction that at the end result is going to be, going to be worthwhile. Mm -hmm. One final question. Um, speaking of getting stuck, after someone's been practicing 5, 10, 20 years, <clears throat> do you have any insights on how to keep the practice alive so they don't get stuck in a rut or a routine and continue to grow and develop. Well, again, go back to what I just said, keep inquiring, Am I, is there something beyond this that I should, I should know? Is there something else I should do? Um, are there any troublesome conditions that I've overlooked that need to be uh, overcome or let go or transcended? Uh, so occasional self-evaluation can be helpful. Uh, and uh, that's all I know. And also, think in terms of sharing uh, whatever enlightenment we have in a constructive way with other people. And we don't all have the mission or the or the even the, the ability to teach, uh, to, to write, to teach, to so forth. But we do all have the ability to see for others their highest good and believe on their behalf that they can have it, that they can, they can realize it. And I recommend that every day 
not only after meditation, but whenever we think of the world seen or of the people, that we just sort of bless the world with our consciousness and uh, radiate goodwill and feel, maybe perhaps imagine that the purity of our essence is blending with the collective consciousness and somehow beneficially influencing everything, everyone and everything. Uh, in the Yoga Sutta, Patanjali uh, has uh, the advice for uh, cultivating emotional, mental and emotional uh, peacefulness and stability to think in terms of having a friendly relationship with uh, with uh, all people in all, all forms of life, be thankful for the good fortune that other people have, and to observe whatever happens in life with dispassionate objectivity. That means without emotion, undue emotional reaction. Just observe it. And uh, this way we have a peace of mind uh, and, and emotional stability even before we are fully spiritually enlightened. In the Yoga Sutra again, in, in the second section, so we call it second chapter, uh, when uh, Kriya Yoga is uh, specifically discussed. Of course, Patanjali mentions uh, Kriya Yoga practice as including constructive discipline of, of thinking and behavior, self-inquiry, what am I, what is my true nature, using discriminative intelligence and meditative uh, experience, and also letting go of this illusion or this mistaken sense of self-identity, the small confined sense of self-identity, and he says this Kriya Yoga, this is what Kriya Yoga practice is, and it is done, it is a practice to remove the, what he calls the afflictions or the troublesome conditions in our, in our psyche, and also for the cultivation of samadhi or transcendent realization. So we can remember what is the end result of right practice. And uh, but after meditation, we can sit for a few minutes and just see the highest good for everyone, which is their health, happiness, and most of all, spiritual awareness. And then, whenever we think of someone, or the con- world conditions are pre- presented to us as they are almost every day now on television, we instead of becoming embittered and cynical and uh, disappointed and fearful or depressed, we can say, well, beyond this is a higher possibility. And uh, in, in the, things are improving, and uh, they'll continue to improve. So we see, we, we, it's not a Pollyanna, superficial, childish uh, attitude, uh, like, oh, everything's going to work out all right, and so, so forth, but actually seeing it in consciousness and having this compassion for everyone in all life so that we want to the highest and best for everyone and uh, do our part to see that and also in our life to help to demonstrate it or help to make it happen without being a forceful i'm not for being an activist and taking to the streets with some with, with placards and, and and banners i don't think that's our way but uh and i so somewhat I disapprove with, with dispassionate objectivity when I see thousands of people taking to the streets and shouting and sh- displaying their anger and their emotion. I don't think that's the way to bring about useful change. Now and then, public demonstration has been necessary in the past, like with Martin Luther King during this period to, to break down segregation and so forth. Sometimes people have to stand up and make, let their voice be heard. But most of the time, we can live quiet lives and uh, not be exceptional in, in the eyes of others. Not, uh, just appear to be quite normal, but inside be different. Mm-hmm. I think that's important. The inside, I think, is important. Mm-hmm. How we are there. Right. Well, in, in this time, you've covered, I think, the essence of Kriya Yoga and the essence of uh, how to practice well. So, um, I want to thank you. You're for, welcome. For being here. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Yeah. And um, I'll put a link to the website for CSA, which is csa-davis.org. Is that correct? Yeah. So mm-hmm. if you want to learn more about the retreat center here and Mr. Davis's work, it's csa-davis.org. 
Thank you very much. All right, you're right, welcome. This episode of the Kriya Yoga podcast was made possible by donations from Kriya Yoga apprenticeship students and supporters of our Patreon community at www.patreon.com forward slash Kriya Yoga.